welcome to Tea and Strumpets, a Regency Romance Review. I'm Zoe. And I'm Kelsey. And today I thought we should revisit a few things. I've got a couple more um actuallys <laughs> uh, to do with pronunciations. You know, I mean, we try, but even in the last episode, I got something wrong and I haven't been corrected yet, but I want to correct it. <laughs> Correct away, Zoe. I'm going to let you do the talking on this one. (laughs) All right. So I've kept a tally (laughs) of all the things that we have so far said wrong. (laughs) So, I mean, it's just so weird going from reading these books and you write the notes about the podcast and all of a sudden you realize, oh my gosh, I don't know how to say this. So we're trying, but hey, you know, Pobody's nerfect. So So the first one I think was St. Giles, which I believe we pronounced St. Giles the first time. So way to go us. Nice there. Um, I think our favorite (laughs) mispronunciation by far is Poochalist, which that's the correct pronunciation. But we said Pugliest and then thought of that cute pug in boxing shorts and boxing gloves and uh, so cute. (laughs) We also mispronounced banal. It is actually banal. And I said banal. And I have been going through my whole life knowing that word is banal. So like what, how, what, how, oh my God, when, when a kind listener wrote to us about that, I was just so floored. I was, <laughs> I couldn't believe that. I just really didn't know that. So you, you told me that when I was very confused. I had <laughs> no idea that was what the pronunciation was. <laughs> I also mispronounced the Welsh town that our ladies lived in last episode, which I pronounced Langolin. And again, it's Welsh, so I'm still going to probably get it wrong. But it sounds like when I listen to the pronunciation thing, it's Clangotlin. But hey, I'm not Welsh, so that one's a probably a miss. And two, two more, which is curacle. I think we said curacle, and that is a conveyance, curacle. Mm-hmm. And I think we just stumbled through apoplexy, which, uh, you know. Well, you know, I think you had me test run that like three times. And I was <laughs> like, I think, I think this is as good as it's going to get. <laughs> hey, we all have those days. And the reason that I was thinking about all of these ones is because we have a tough one today, too. <laughs> we do. So... We have a character, it is a cat, and we have gone with the pronunciation of Charybdis, because that is what my dictionary was telling me to pronounce it as. So, if I read the thing correctly, that's how we were going to pronounce it. (laughs) And we did look up a couple of different pronunciations. It sounds like maybe if you're Greek, you would pronounce the first CH as a CH sound like a chet in in Hebrew. I know that sound, but it sounded like that. And I don't think that we would do that justice or do it very well. So we're going to go with Charybdis. And that is spelled C-H-A-R-Y-B-D-I-S. So hopefully those of you listening can understand why we have a difficulty with ancient Greek here. But (laughs) we will persevere. And while we aren't perfect, we do appreciate hearing from you guys about these little missteps because it does help us get better. So before we jump into the book we've read this week, I have a question for you, Kelsey. I have an answer. All right. Well, who is your favorite fictional animal sidekick? So funny story about this. When I first read this question, I had to think about it. And initially, my thought was going to be Pascal from Rapunzel. Good choice. Because he's fantastic. But then I remembered there was a better one. And Mm -hmm. so there's a story behind it, guys. (laughs) Sometimes when I get into my car, my Bluetooth will hook up to my phone. And instead of playing the most recent podcast or skipping over to whatever the next podcast in the queue is, it will instead turn on my iTunes and start playing music from my past, which I used to share an iTunes account with my sister. So it's a wide variety of stuff. (laughs) And so on this particular rainy day, I hopped in the car and what should happen? The song that came on was Dig a Little Deeper from The Princess and the Frog, which is a great number. And by the end of the number, I was like, 
okay, I really need to re-listen to this whole soundtrack. Mm-hmm. So I did. I started it from the beginning, listened to the whole thing. And then when I got home, I promptly put on the movie Aww. and watched the whole thing again. So my actual favorite fictional animal sidekick is Ray because he is fabulous. That is such a good choice. I haven't seen The Princess and the Frog in so long. I think I only saw it once. It was one of those that I I think it came out when I was in college. That was like the lesser Disney years for me. Mm -hmm. But you actually just reminded me of who mine is. And Mm -hmm. maybe I'm forgetting one, but... I think mine is Max from Rapunzel. I mean, that's a that's a very good one as well. <laughs> Max is hilarious. He's so funny. He's the horse. And I mean, I love horses, but he's just so funny. And he's a character in his own right. He's not really a sidekick. He kind of leads the way. He I does. mean, come on. <laughs> and, you know, he has this whole arc and he comes around and he's so expressive and funny. And I just... I absolutely adore him. So I think he's my favorite right now. He was a top contender for me as well. But Raymond, he is my favorite. (laughs) Great choice. (laughs) So the book we are talking about today is How the Marquess Was Won by Julianne Long. And of course, we've got a pretty cool cat sidekick in it, which got us talking about our animal sidekicks, our mispronunciations, and now it's going to get us talking about our history facts. Yes. So today we're going to share with you the story of Scylla and Charybdis. So Scylla, which I'm just pronouncing it because apparently there was multiple pronunciations for this, so that was the one we picked. And Charybdis were monsters from Greek mythology who were thought to inhabit the Straits of Messina, which is the narrow sea between Sicily and the Italian mainland. Scylla was a terrible creature with six heads and 12 feet who was known to prey on passing mariners, while Charybdis, who lived on the opposite side of the Straits, was a monster who over time came to be described as a whirlpool. These monsters really gave Odysseus a crazy hard time when he was working to navigate the passage in Homer's Odyssey. So there's a bit of ambiguity surrounding Charybdis's legend, and she is described as, quote, a monster of unknown description. But she was thought to be the daughter of Poseidon and Gaia, who is Mother Earth. And she was thrown to her position opposite Scylla in the Straits after being struck by Zeus's thunderbolt, perhaps as a punishment for her lustful character. That guy is one to talk. (laughs) Zeus punishing someone for lustful behavior. Please. Obscene. But Charybdis is rationalized into a whirlpool or maelstorm, and her waters were considered to suck in and blow out three times each day. Such was the powerful force of this turbulence that no ship could survive Charybdis's attentions. So, cool story. Yes. Behind our cat's name. Very cool story. But in our story, we don't have monsters. We have different types of tropes. We sure do. (laughs) Today, we're going to talk about a difference of class, a dowry estate that the hero desperately wants, which I noticed you threw that in there because we've been having that theme a lot. Yeah, we do. It's like there's a piece of property attached to a woman, and that's like part of the deal, right? That (laughs) you have to marry that woman because she has that. And so, okay, so the third trope that I have here is like a little bit of a reach, but I don't think so. And I'd love to hear from listeners if they agree or disagree about this. But I think that there's definitely, to me, this book reminds me a lot of She's All That, the movie, Mm -hmm. especially at the end. And She's All That is based on My Fair Lady, which is based on Pygmalion. And it also has like undertones of the emperor's new clothes a little bit where it's like, you know, the emperor is told he looks great and he's actually Mm -hmm. naked, which I think is like there's similarities in She's All That to the emperor's new clothes because she's not she's not privy to the fact that she's there's a bet about her. Mm -hmm. And similar things happen in our book today. So I feel like there's a little bit of inspiration from all those things. I would agree with the whole she's all that thing. Yeah. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I will also add some tropes of we have a very distinguished, reserved lord. And on the other side, we have a very plucky, spunky, do-it-yourself miss. Because she's not a lady, she's a miss. Love it. And I agree. And those main characters are Julian Spencer, Marquess Dryden, also known as Lord Ice by the Broadsheets, Mm -hmm. and Miss Phoebe Vale. Yes. So our story begins with a familiar penny royal scene. The pig and thistle is full and brimming with the usual sorts of pub activities when the door bangs open. 
this sort of thing is usual for a pub, even men staggering in wouldn't really be something to talk about, except that the man who stumbles in is Julian Spencer, the Marquess Dryden, also known as Lord Ice, and apparently he's been shot. And Colin and Chase Eversee, as retired soldiers, spring into action, scurrying him away to the storeroom to assess his wounds. And Dryden is lucid enough, enough to remark how he's thankful that it's an Eversee helping him and not a Redmond. Hmm. But, <laughs> but when they prompt him to name his assailant, it seems that all Lord Ice can talk about is a woman. Yes, while the Eversee brothers attend his gunshot, which is luckily not too terrible, but you know, a gunshot's a gunshot, especially in this time. Dryden continues to bemoan the terrible interactions with this woman, saying, She's not even pretty. The Marquess seemed intent on making a case. Fever? Colin mouth to Chase across the Marquess's prone body. Love, Chase mouthed back. Beautiful, though, the Marquess muttered grimly. Damn her eyes. Ugh. Well, at first, Colin and Chase find his lovesickness endearing. When Dryden continues with, she doesn't love me, they decide to send for their cousin, Adam the Vicar, just in case as, quote, they were terrible words to die on if that's what he was going to do. And so from this crazy scene with the Eversees, suddenly we jump to six weeks earlier, where we meet our heroine, Miss Phoebe Vale, as she enters another Penny Royal establishment, Post the Weights and Porium. I'm very sorry if that was mispronounced. That's a very tricky word. <laughs> <laughs> Emporium of Ladies' Goods, where she introduces herself to the reader with a volley of conversation with our proprietor. She's bemoaning the windy day because, quote, Papa won't allow us to use the carriage until he said the guilt on the coat of arms repaired painted. To which Polstelwaite replies, Tisk, now cannot have a carriage without the family coat of arms shining from the door, can ya? However will the world know you're inside? And so we as the reader quickly understand Phoebe to be an imaginative, charming lady who does not have that sort of station. That's all sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But she enjoys a good fun. And the two exchange more gossip about Phoebe and the tons favorite subject, Lord Ice. So we learn Lord Ice can do no wrong. He is revered amongst the ton, and his every action is copied, like when he bought four black horses with white stockings, a rash of horse thievery, and dyeing horses a different color, followed in the wake of his purchase as everybody rushed to copy. So he is known for, quote, doing anything to elicit a gasp. He made reckless things, horse races, and blood-chillingly high wagers seems so sane and effortless that in a rush to emulate him, London bloods broke their neck or lost their fortunes, while Dryden always emerged with his arctic dignity and his enormous fortune unscathed. Every man wanted to be Lord Dryden, and if one believed the broadsheets, every woman wanted to be with Lord Dryden. But that is also what has made him Phoebe's favorite subject, and one who frequently haunted her imagination. Phoebe knew everything there was to know about Lord Ice, because she religiously studied the broadsheets. And currently, the rumor is that he is looking for a wife. And while Phoebe knows that she has an admittedly fine complexion, <laughs> Lord Ice is simply a daydream. She's of a different class, and they won't even have a chance to meet. Like, they're never going to run into each other. Definitely not. So Phoebe opens the mail she has received at Postal Waits, and she has been issued an invitation from Lizbeth Redmond to act as a companion for a house party for a few days. She'd once been Lizbeth's tutor, and while Lizbeth had been an exceedingly reluctant student, she had been a fine friend. Plus, Phoebe rationalizes she could use a little extra money, so she's inclined to accept. But as she finishes this thought, a shadow is cast over the store, and Phoebe looks outside to see a pristine black carriage pulled by four black horses with four white stockings each. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and guys, the Marquess enters and introduces himself with one word, Dryden. Oof. Phoebe is in shock, and Pulsaway was also, but he recovered quickly, and goes to help Dryden pick out a lovely ladies' fan for a gift. And Pulsaway's kind of talking with Dryden, 
And Dryden explains that he's in town for a party and to tour Miss Endicott's as he has a recalcitrant niece. And Postoy generously introduces Phoebe as a teacher at the academy. To which Dryden replies, Miss Vale. He gave her a bit of a bow. I'm to meet with Miss Endicott at the academy. The faintest conclusive emphasis landed on the word Miss Endicott. Likely he was accustomed to females of all sorts flinging themselves at him and hoped to discourage her from doing the same. Of course. Too late, Phoebe heard the hint of irony in her voice. Of course you'll be meeting with the most important person at the academy. She could have sworn his eyes glinted swiftly. A flash. And then gone. <laughs> but before he can leave the shop, another gentleman enters who the Marquess knows. It's Waterburn, who is a Viscount known for, quote, whimsical wagers of staggering amounts. And he appears to have been invited to the same party as Dryden. And after noticing Phoebe, who is still loitering at a nearby counter, issues a challenge in a hushed voice. Ten pounds if Dryden kisses La Insegante. <laughs> Uh, well, Phoebe speaks five languages, even if I don't. She <laughs> knows that what he said means, quote, the teacher, and she is horrified that the object of her daydreams is in a discussion about this. And he doesn't even seem keen to take the bet, and she can't tell if that's because she, quote, doesn't look kissable or if it would be, quote, child's play. And so she is mortified and humiliated from the beginning of this cruel situation. Quote, bloody aristocrats, how very disappointing to discover they were mortal and childish. Uh, it's always hard to see that. <laughs> I know. So Phoebe leaves the shop to begin the fortifying uphill climb to Miss Endicott's. And now we get to start learning a bit about our Marquess. It seems he isn't enamored with his brand of fame and has worked very hard in his life to cultivate an image that would set him very far apart from his passionate disprobate of a father. He has methodically set about righting all his father's wrongs, paying off his debts, and restoring all the family's properties since his death. He has married off all his sisters well and has solved all the family crises as they come. There is, of course, one last piece of the puzzle which is an estate that came with his mother's dowry, which his father lost in a card game, to Isaiah Redmond. And this estate is now attached to another dowry, Redmond's niece, Lisbeth. Ah, so now we know what he's doing in Penny Royal. We sure do. And back in her room, but still in a huff about insensitive aristocrats, Phoebe whips out a note to reply a decline to Lisbeth's invitation, but is interrupted with a summons to Miss Endicott's office, where there she is informed that Miss Endicott must leave at once to catch the mail coach to her sisters for the summer holiday. And would Phoebe please show the Marquess of Dryden some of the classroom facilities? The Marquess had mentioned meeting her at Postal Waits, so Miss Endicott felt she was perfect for the job. <laughs> the Marquess himself is, of course, also in the office, and he says, I shall be grateful if you would show me a classroom, Miss Vale, he said at last. He was exquisitely polite, though he likely would have said, I should like you to stuff it, Miss Vale, in the same tone. <laughs> And uh, Phoebe can be exquisitely polite, too, and she acquiesces with an, if you would follow me, Lord Dryden, and departs with a slightly more brisk than polite pace. They begin chatting about the school and his nieces recalcitrance, and while Phoebe keeps up a brilliant conversation, she can't help but think how good he smells. But... Even as she's talking and smelling how lovely he is, she reminds herself of the incident at the store and how unkissable the two thought her. She even goes as far as to point out to Dryden that they teach languages, and he flirts back with a line one of his mistresses shouted at him in Spanish, which the end translates to, you son of a whore. Feebly, gently only translates the beginning back as she knows he knows. <laughs> so their banter continues, and the Marquess relaxes in her presence. Phoebe can't help but be witty and sarcastic, and she matches him shot for shot in conversation and innuendo to innuendo when the conversation turns there. And then they find themselves alone in a classroom, the picturesque Sussex landscape and the setting sun outside the windows with a moment of silence and two realizations. First, unbidden, Phoebe has the thought, he's meant for me. And second, if he was going to try to win the bet, now was the perfect time and place to do it. But Phoebe is not one to be predictable. <laughs> and so she says, 
well, Lord Dryden, you may as well get it over with. The smile vanished. I beg your pardon? You're going to try to kiss me, aren't you? And <laughs> the Marquess <laughs> stammers a bit until at last he just expresses good humored defeat as, quote, announcing it certainly takes all the fun out of it. And Phoebe knows she shouldn't, but she just can't help it. And so she says, all the fun? To which he replies, Miss Vale, are you flirting with me? And she replies, would it surprise you if I said yes? She was laughing silently at him. Because I'm plain, and I shouldn't have such skills at my disposal, and because you've only learned one way to play the game, and it involves you applying charm and the maiden capitulating, don't you ever tire of it? Of things always being the same? <laughs> and while he stutters that she isn't plain, and she is sends that... Yes, yeah, she knows her complexion is very fine. <laughs> Julian realizes that she is toying with him. And he finds her wit and charm very refreshing. And did he actually want to kiss her? But their banter continues and they learn a bit more about each other. One important fact being that Phoebe intends to go to Africa soon with missionaries as a teacher because, quite simply, she wants to see the world. To which Julian says, Some people start with Italy or Brighton. I thought perhaps I would begin at the far end and work my way back. Isn't that so cute? Oh, so darling. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, we also learn more about the Marquess because when Phoebe admits she knows all about him from the London broadsheets, he starts to educate her on what they've gotten wrong, which is the ever-present responsibility of being the head of a family, the drainage ditches at his Hereford estates, the excellent herd of sheep he has just acquired, and even with all this talk of duty, Julian feels perilously close to happy. Needless to say, he's surprised. But Phoebe astutely sees that his duty has confined him, his personality, his life, his emotions. And now that she has stated it, he, quote, could almost feel the sides of an invisible box all around him. But their conversation continues, and before they part, they return to talking about a kiss. The sunlight, the seclusion, and the sparring have ramped up the tension tighter than a bowstring. But Phoebe just steers the conversation back to safer subjects and takes her leave. To say that the two were unaffected by the sunset interaction would be wholly inaccurate. And when Phoebe returns to her room, she discards her decline and instead pens an acceptance to Lisbeth's party. Yes. So she arrives at the Redmonds. Phoebe is dismayed to discover that she isn't housed with the family, but rather in the wing with the governesses and the land stewards and the like. Not quite a servant, not quite a guest. Lisbeth seems appropriately sheepish about it. And as it is her aunt's house anyway, Phoebe doesn't hold it against her. Plus, the room is nice and the bed is fluffy, much better than what she has. The only thing missing is her cat Charybdis, who she left back at Miss Endicott's for the few days she would be with the Redmonds. So the first event is a general milling about the salon, and Phoebe settles in to meet the other guests and to see if her prediction that Dryden would be at this party is correct. And of course, he is, and he stills when he sees her. He is standing next to Lisbeth, who is now holding the lovely fan that he bought when she first saw him. Mm. Ah, and so feelings crash down around Phoebe as she realizes what a fool she's been coming here, as she knows that there are rumors that he is seeking a wife. But Lisbeth notices Dryden's stillness and looks to Phoebe. She sweetly asks, Phoebe, would you be a dear and fetch my reticule for me? It's upstairs, in my bedchamber. Phoebe is taken aback. She is not a servant. She's not being paid to be a servant. She's paid to be a chaperone. But after Lord Dryden introduces himself to Phoebe, she decides to get it anyway. Drawn to her, Jules excuses himself without an explanation, but does give Lisbeth a warm smile. He catches Phoebe near an alcove and, quote, I didn't know you'd be attending this house party, he begins. And so starts their singular banter, where Phoebe explains that she is a paid companion invited by Lisbeth. So Jules says, ah, are you a decoy, like a wooden duck set free in a pond during hunting season? Are you suggesting that you're drawn to me, Lord Dryden? So their banter returns to discussing the kiss, where then, in a diversionary tactic, Phoebe tries, quote, Honestly, Lord Dryden, I will loan you ten pounds. It's exhausting to witness you working so hard just to get a kiss. <laughs> Oh, Phoebe. <laughs> but he insists he never took the wager. However, if Waterburn should issue it again, 
So discussion returns to slightly more sobering things, this time Lisbeth and her fan. And he admits he got it for her because it reminded him of her. Quote, exquisite and pink and fair and rare, Phoebe said lightly. Delicate and particular and expensive. He smiled faintly. Oh, and everything else you said, of course. Hasn't anyone ever given you the perfect gift, Miss Vale? Of course, no one has given her a gift that makes her feel known. Does anyone really know anyone, he asks? Because take, for example, the broadsheets. Did she know that he is actually never reckless? Quote, have you considered, Miss Vale, that what you read in the broadsheets is an interpretation of me? That they report on my comings and goings and pastimes like so many anthropologists and draw conclusions about my character from a scattered few things and that perhaps they've gotten it wrong? The conversation turns then to her and to her teaching and what brought her down that path. And she is slightly vague on all her answers, but of course banters back until he finally says, perhaps your story could be your gift to me. And she replies, oh, honestly, I'm hardly Scheherazade, only realizing too late the unfortunate innuendo inherent in that tale. (laughs) But he insists that he must know her story, quote, because it's yours. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she barters back for a gift from him and he says he will get her one once he has her story so she begins i was born in london she says this and then artfully makes her exit to receive <laughs> lisbeth's reticule for quote if they were to know each other for a thousand and one days perhaps he would hear the rest of it And, quote, his gratifying expression of bald, astonished admiration was the last thing she saw. (laughs) The next day dawns rainy and they find themselves pleasantly ensconced in one of the parlors embroidering while men do men things. But Phoebe learns that there is to be excellent entertainment that evening in the form of a famous soprano here to sing for them. Lisbeth has heard that she is known to take lovers, and she innocently asks Phoebe if she thinks that the Marquess would do such a thing. Oh, <laughs> oh poor Lisbeth. Oh, Lisbeth. <laughs> yeah. But Phoebe isn't here to tutor Lisbeth in the ways of the world and gently teases her way through the conversation until Lisbeth's honest literalness makes Phoebe take pity on her to reply that she is certain he does as all men of his station do, which is basically a cop out because she's not confirming nor denying this. <laughs> But it's literally in all the broadsheets. Come on, Lisbeth. Ugh, this, <laughs> Read this girl's a gossip ridiculous. <laughs> yes. Lisbeth <laughs> processes this as best she can and turns the conversation to safer thoughts of herself, to the match that everyone sees happening between her and the Marquess. After all, he is known for only wanting the finest and best things. And Lisbeth is very happy about this as she finds him very sweet. <laughs> and Phoebe almost can't stifle a snort at this. These two are so obviously unmatched by personality, but they are perfectly paired by society. A match made in purgatory? <laughs> when the evening performance dawned, Lisbeth is obviously agitated because the Marquess isn't to be seen. This is probably what prompts her to ask Phoebe to retrieve her shawl for her, although the room is stiflingly hot. Phoebe is not amused, but decides not to make a scene and does her bidding. This is fortuitous because on her way through the courtyard, she runs into the instigator himself, smoking a church. Julian admits that he can't watch the performance because he knows the soprano intimately. Ah, that (laughs) talk of mistresses. I know. It's so close to home. And he prefers not to cause a scene. He doesn't want to make Lisbeth uncomfortable. And after they talk a bit, Phoebe makes an astute observation about Julian. Quote, Lord Dryden, it strikes me that you consistently associate with women who are possessed of fiery temperaments, which is interesting when you're so very, she searched just for the right word, contained. And He is not pleased with her assessment. Quote, Is that what you think? I'm cold. I'm hard. The broadsheets think so. No. The word was emphatic and immediate and soothing. She'd sense she'd drawn blood, hurt him somehow. But in truth, it was a thought she'd entertained about him before. No. Instinctively, she softened her voice. I do know the difference between cold and an abundance of caution. I'm hardly dispassionate, Miss Vale. Oh, I didn't think for a moment that you were. 
Julian then proceeds to tell her more of his history and the crushing weight of responsibilities thrust upon him at a young age. How he had to do everything right and never put even one foot wrong. How he had to be methodical and always do the right thing. So much so that by this point, it's basically second nature to him. He had become a legend as a result of all these things, who was admired and imitated but never matched. And the talk continues to his promise to his mother to restore all the lands, including the dowry property, which he admits is now attached to Lisbeth. Phoebe, quote, was speechless. He was going about the business of marriage the same way he'd gone about the business of his life, purposely. Soon, though, the music starts and Phoebe is stunned into silence because hearing opera for the first time has a profound effect on Phoebe, so much so that she grasps Julian's arm for support as she is swept away. And Julian understands her reaction and they share a sympathetic moment while the music soars. In between pieces, Phoebe starts to shiver and Julian begins to shrug out of his coat, which startles them both as they realize the impossibility of this gesture due to their classes. It's enough to push Phoebe to return to the music room. As she retreats, he shouts, Where in London, Scheherazade? Seven dials, she shouts back, thinking, Mull that over here in the dark, Lord Dryden. And you owe me a gift? (laughs) (laughs) Hee hee! So much pluck. So once returned, Lisbeth does not comment on the length of the trip, as she has also been taken by the music, but she does comment on the chariot smell. Luckily, Jonathan Redman is sitting nearby and admits it must be him. And we as the reader don't know, like, is he doing this out of charity? Is he just luckily smells like cheroot or cheroot? Or who knows? I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) I mean, we know that he likes messing with Lisbeth. Like, who knows? I I think Jonathan's astute. I think Jonathan knows what's going on. I think Jonathan does too. He's not an idiot. No. The next day finds our Marquez back at Postal Waits, but with a finger to still the vendor who offers help. Julian walks to where he remembers Phoebe standing so that he can be sure to pick out the bonnet she'd been staring holes at while he was there the last time. He knows he should shouldn't do this task himself, but he is here and the bonnet is bought. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And later, the Marquess is awaiting the party in church with inappropriate excitement tingling through him. And wow, that sounds extra risque as he's in a church. <laughs> but anyway, he is hoping that Phoebe is wearing the bonnet and is rewarded with her beaming smile when she enters bonneted. Uh. <laughs> and she had found the package outside her room in the morning and what an unboxing it was. And seeing her beaming puts a large smile on his face, which startles everyone who's looking at him into wondering, like, who is the subject of such a vivid emotion? And lucky for him, Lisbeth is just in front of Phoebe, so we have an acceptable scapegoat, and Lisbeth even believes the smile to be for her. But truly, nothing can bring Phoebe's spirits down because it is the perfect gift that he had noticed her adoration and had returned for the right bonnet. And she's touched. But not only did the bonnet tug at her heart, but so did the accompanying note, which read, I should like to know you. And while she theorizes that the bonnet must represent a strategy at the very least, she remembers when he said, quote, no one talks to me the way you do. She thought of the Marquess scooping a moth out of the air and releasing it again, only to watch it head straight for the lamp again, helpless not to risk its whole existence for light and warmth. However, Phoebe is wrong. (laughs) Julian has no idea why he really bought the bonnet. He just knew that he had to. And they finally get to talk later on on the healthful walk that they've all been roped into by Lisbeth when the two of them hang back from the party. I like your bonnet, Miss Vale, he said finally. Do you? It's new, you know. (laughs) I love her. (laughs) I do too. Uh, And he says, hardly new. I'm given to understand that a certain young lady nearly stared holes in it before I purchased it. You can count yourself fortunate it remains intact. One might say the same thing about you, my lord, given how a gathering tends to stare at you. He laughed, but then, with great trepidation, asked the question he'd been dreading. Is it the right bonnet? She let him suffer for a second or so. Or at least that's how it seemed. It's the right one. I love this interaction. It's so cute. It is. And with such a personal and perfect gift, and with our witty main characters, this can only lead to flirting, which leads to path wandering, which leads to their first mightily explosive kiss in a clearing of sage 
But they've been gone quite some time, and while clawing up each other, they begin to hear the others calling out for them. rut row. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't quite let this stop them, and the voices get far too close when they pull apart. This leads to the Marquess having to a duck under a bush and a slightly suspicious but ultimately okay Lisbeth finding Phoebe who is hiding his hat under her back and look over there! She throws the hat towards where she knows Julian is hiding and it hits him in the forehead which causes a bruise. It's quite a comedy of errors but it all works out. But eventually they all reunite on the path and order is restored. Julian walks with Lizbeth and Phoebe trails behind with the old friendly dog. Phoebe seems content but Julian is uncomfortable with Phoebe trailing anyone. Hmm. That evening, everyone is attending the Redmond Ball. Phoebe is feeling particularly pretty, even though she knows that her simple ball gown pales in comparison to the more elite guests. Lizbeth is sparkling like a crown jewel in her finery, and Jules is moping because he is confused, lovesick, and sporting a terrible bruise on his forehead, which has prompted him to change his hair and sport a forelock. Uh. <laughs> he knows that this will cause a fashion, and he is not looking forward to that. The kiss in the clearing has rattled him, and he does not like being rattled, now does he? <laughs> no, he does not. And so when he sees Lisbeth at the ball, he can't help but acknowledge her beauty. Quote, But he was conscious of looking at her the way a man admires the main course, dutifully, while looking forward to dessert. Dessert was sitting right next to Lisbeth. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> While Julian is enraptured, Waterburn notices and, ask if he, and asks if he's staring at the governess. Julian unfortunately replies a little more vehemently than necessarily that she's a schoolmistress. Get it right. <laughs> Ever irritating. Waterburn provides an astute yet glib reply that boils down to he thinks Jules is sporting an expression that he can't quite place, which of course piques Waterburn's curiosity. And he keeps pressing to finally ask, do you find her Miss Vale? He said her name almost satirically. Appealing, Dryden. To which Julian provides another slightly too forceful reply that, while saying he doesn't, conveys that he actually does. Ah, and so Waterburn continues to be an asshole and says he's surprised Dryden wouldn't find something more beautiful to rest his eyes on, but thanks him, quote, and I salute you, you clever devil. I would never have had an inspiration if not for you. Mm. Foreshadowing. Yes. <laughs> Phoebe's night is going significantly better than Julian's. People have been giving her attention. It started with Lord Waterburn, who asked her for a waltz. And while Phoebe has never been particularly enamored of the Viscount, he is a Viscount after all, and she loves to dance. Then Jonathan provides an introduction to Sir Joffrey D'Andre, and her next waltz is claimed. And finally, the Silverton sisters, twins Marie and Antoinette, Yes, that is, a, that is a thing. Ask Lisbeth for an introduction to Phoebe as well, and the twins are quickly enamored with Phoebe's wit, humor, and originality. The night is delightful, except for during one of the waltzes when dancing with other partners, Phoebe and Julian lock eyes and the intensity causes Julian to stumble. And in an effort to save his partner, Lisbeth, she is shot across the room while he spins to his knees, only to rise as she comes twirling back to him. And thus, a new dance craze is born. Ah. <laughs> and the night is full of dancing, banter, betting. Phoebe won 10 pounds and a few too many drinks. And even though Phoebe doesn't get to dance with Jules, she can't remember a more fun night in a long time. On her way back to her room, she finds Jules in the courtyard. The drinking and the tense energy it took to keep apart since the kiss has worn thin. It takes little coaxing for Jules to persuade Phoebe to waltz with him under the stars. And the moonlit night and the waltz and the solitude leads to the usual things it leads to. And the two find themselves locked in a slightly less frantic but no less passionate kiss. This kiss leads to unlacing, unbuttoning, and of course, an undoing in more ways than one. And Julian mm -hmm. offers Phoebe everything. Gowns and pelisses and boots and bonnets, a beautiful, elegant home, a feather bed, a carriage, the finest food. And of course, Phoebe is crushed. She has told him much of her life before this point. How her father never came home one day, how her mother was arrested for pickpocketing and likely transported, how desperately she wishes to belong somewhere. 
he should know that that kind of life isn't the kind of life she wants for herself. So she acerbically replies, and where will your wife live? And Jules insists that he hasn't made any promises, that he hasn't led her astray. This is so unimportant to Phoebe because what matters is now, and now is a terrible moment. She pulls up her dress and makes her exit. Quote, the two of them were patently ridiculous now, with their clothing in disarray, his trousers open, her dress unlaced, the aftermath of an absurd fever. What had she expected anyway? The past several days had been comprised of one magical moment layered upon another. She'd gotten spoiled and complacent. For a moment in time, she'd expected the narrative to end the way Cinderella's story had, not the way a Greek myth would, with the poor molested nymph turning herself into an olive tree or some such to free herself from one of the gods' clutches. She couldn't do that, but she could go to Africa. But when she wakes up in the morning, it, quote, seemed the fairy tale had acquired a second act, for Phoebe has received an invitation for a fortnight in London with the Silverton sisters. She isn't even to worry about clothes. They have so many to share, and she could bring her cat. Unsure of what to do, she goes to breakfast where Elizabeth pitches a sour fit when she hears Phoebe's invitation. Her petulance and jealousy give Phoebe all she needs to make the decision. She may as well have two weeks of fun in London before she heads to Africa. And in London, Jules is pining, but back to business as he must. While he's at White's for a meeting with Isaiah Redman, he overhears Waterburn and DeAndre conferring over the betting books. And as his father was a notorious gambler, Julian never even goes near the books, but he can't help but overhear their terms. 200 pounds for a first appearance of a nickname, 500 for hothouse flowers sent to her, 1,000 for a dual challenge. And he is unimpressed with their schoolboy excitement over their latest bet, and he doesn't make any connections at this time. Oh, and also everyone inside White's is sporting a forelock. <laughs> <laughs> Dryden, however, takes the time to talk with Isaiah Redman about business and properties and the Mercury Club and, you know, businessy stuff to close the scene. Phoebe, meanwhile, is settling in at the Silvertons. She's been greeted warmly and shown to a room in the family quarters this time. Charybdis is, has been introduced Marie and Antoinette are determined to win his favor, and Phoebe even finds herself wrapped in a bit of a trick by encouraging Lisbeth to check what's in her basket without revealing it's a grumpy cat. <laughs> and Lisbeth has a bit of a fright. Ow. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but Charybdis is unfortunately relegated to Phoebe's room <laughs> as the Silverton matriarch has a Pekingese and a rather verbose parrot. But Lizbeth recovers from her shock of the cat swipe in time for Julian to arrive to take her riding. And he is stunned stiff to see Phoebe in the foyer. And on their ride, he is not a good companion. And he even shrinks to the level to ask Lizbeth about Phoebe, which makes her upset and suspicious inwardly and flippant outwardly. Mm. Jules is conflicted because he knows what a bear he's being. And he knows that Lisbeth is a nice woman. And while she deserves better, and he's resolved to try, she just seems so young. And while he's helping her from her horse, Lisbeth stiffens. She has smelled smoke, and he apologizes. He even says, is it truly that bad? It's a singular blend of my own. And Lisbeth is not completely ignorant. She recognizes the smell, but recovers the conversation for a beautiful goodbye. So that evening, Phoebe, in a fit of whimsy, decides to clip an orchid blossom from the arrangement in her room in her hair. She is excited and buoyant about the ball tonight. She feels confident and happy, even though she recognizes the absurdity of the whole situation. But the blossom is the perfect conversation starter. And while Phoebe is by no means the belle of the ball, she is with the popular Silverton sisters and Lizbeth. And so she is constantly surrounded. She is pretty quickly declared an original, and while she can hardly believe it, her entire dance card is soon filled. And, quote, for the first time, a bit of doubt crept in about whether she might want to go to Africa after all. Oh, she's having so much fun. Of course, Jules can't stop staring at her during the ball, and inappropriately even, to the point where she is a bit abashed, and he is drawn to her inexplicably, even though he knows he shouldn't. He's really surprised to find her here, given all her talk about Africa. And they had said goodbye. And Phoebe just explains that she was invited by the sisters, and that she decided to seize the moment, and... 
though the two of them are kind of angry at each other, they fall back into their easy banter and they're saved from perhaps something when Dryden tries to ask for a dance and she reveals that her card is completely full. And Julian is frustrated. Why won't she see reason? Why won't she see all the good between them? Why won't she be his mistress? Wah, wah, wah. But Phoebe stands strong and insists that he cannot fit her neatly into a box. And they are saved again from further argument by one of her dance partners coming to collect her. And side note, we also find out at this party that she has a pair of custom kid gloves that she was wearing. And they were intended for Olivia Eversee. And they were given to her by Lion, who was the first person she ever kissed. And this isn't really important to the story, but it's good build up for later. Yes. So. Just important for like later in the series. Just keep that in the back of your mind, guys. I've Six been... books from now. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, guys. I've been highlighting these Easter eggs and I fully plan to do a recap of all of them. <laughs> so Julian's frustration only increases as the ball continues. He asks Lizbeth what she wants from life and finds her answer predictably shallow. Not terrible or malicious, just not terribly deep. He is starting to find their differences to be a bit wider than he originally thought. During this ball, Jules also sees Waterburn and DeAndre exchange money when a man clamors that the original gave him a dance, but he doesn't put two and two together yet. The next morning, Phoebe awakens to find five bouquets of hothouse flowers. Lisbeth only has the one from Dryden, which was accompanied by a note that read, I look forward to seeing you today, Dryden. Phoebe has one more gift, however. It's a bundle of sage with a note that reads, You're wrong. I do know you. Aww. And her heart flutters, but she passes it off as a gift from a lady she met at a ball. But Lizbeth isn't stupid. She recognizes this plant, and so a tense exchange follows that arrival. But the day is full of plans. Lizbeth is to go riding with Jules, and the twins and Phoebe are to take a ride with a few other gentlemen. But so excited by her newfound popularity, Phoebe heads out for the day. And a while after they take their leave, there is a commotion in the Silverton household. The parrot is squawking in French about a monkey, but it turns out to be Charybdis escaped from Phoebe's room. Oh dear, and since the matriarch didn't even know that he was there, she isn't particularly pleased about him, nor worried when he eventually runs out the front door when it opens for Jules. However, Jules realizes who that cat must be, and he knows what that cat means to Phoebe. With a curse, he leaves in pursuit. And what transpires is a delightful, thrilling, hilarious chase through the streets, which culminates in the most perfect of feline capers, the, quote, laying on my back with my cute fluffy belly exposed, don't I look so innocent? <laughs> which is really just a cat trap. <laughs> yes. And uh, Jules does manage to grab him, but Charybdis does what cats do and scratches him ferociously until they come to a truce of sorts. <laughs> But now, Jules is quite late, not just for his ride, but for his meeting with Isaiah. And as he's given his last few pounds to helpful bystanders, he decides to walk with the cat to White's, at least to reschedule his meeting. <laughs> and that is how the cat fad came to be. Oh, this is great. Uh, Phoebe, meanwhile, has come home to learn that her faithful friend has disappeared. The Silverton sisters offer to get her a new cat, but they can't possibly understand. Phoebe turned her head slowly, incredulously, towards Marie. It was her nightmare to be stripped this vulnerable in front of these people, people who thought that a cat was like a police and could be replaced by placing an order somewhere. Ugh. Ugh. They even offer to fire all the maids for her, but Phoebe declines that offer. Then, Lizbeth comes in. Jules hasn't arrived, so she believes, for their ride, and she's like, what's going on? And then Phoebe realizes... Quote, ah, she realized, and here it was. In fairy tales and myths, some terrible sacrifice is endured for wanting the forbidden, the out of reach. Please not, Charybdis. Please, please, please. Someone must have left the door to your room open, Lizbeth said mildly, searching out a reflective surface in the room to nervously admire her reflection. A maid, most likely. Phoebe looked up at her slowly then, and knew. They stared at each other so long that the Silverton sisters began to shift restlessly. You have everything, Phoebe thought, and you still feel so powerless that you had to best me somehow. You had to take my cat from me. You'll have jewels in the end. And still. I hope someone finds your cat, Lisbeth said very kindly after a moment, her stare very fixed. You'd best. Phoebe still hadn't blinked. 
Mm. Uh. Uh. Prissy little bitch. <laughs> it's it's crazy because up until now, she's just been kind of harmless. But yeah, exactly. But, you know, even Phoebe says she's not an idiot and she can put two and two together. But the fact that she mm-hmm. just feels so threatened is just like, ugh. definitely back at White's. However, some great cat based humor occurs and Jules reschedules his meeting with Isaiah before he leaves, though, he does something he's never done. He checks the betting books and discovers with horror that Waterburn and DeAndre have indeed bet on Miss Vale, and they've also roped the Silverton twins in on it since the beginning. They've turned her into a lark. Her success is at their whims, and he is pissed. And while torn, he decides not to tell her about it because she is off for Africa in such a short time, and perhaps she'll never find out. He does, however, send a hack to the Silverton's home to collect her and let her know that he has her cat. And Phoebe does not hesitate and flies down the stairs into the hack once the hack driver delivers a cryptic message that she understands is definitely from Jules. And when she arrives at his home, she is directed upstairs with some St. John's wort, because clearly the cat has made his mark, (laughs) and finds Jules and her cat in his bedroom. And the setting, minus a shirt, plus the application of medicine, leads down a certain path, as these things always do. So we have encounter number one, where he begins to show her the pleasures of the world with a trip under her skirt. And while it's glorious for her, she stops things there. Quote, where is the cat? He sounded dazed. Under the bed. It's his usual refuge. Why? If I take you now right here on this bed, if I make love to you, would he attack me? Why don't you try it and see? Is that an invitation, Miss Vale? It took every ounce of strength she had to say the following, and yet she knew that she meant it. Not in the least. Ugh. But Jules respects this. He's devastated, but respects it. He wants her so badly. Just in this moment, of course, he doesn't quite understand it all yet. So... They part ways. The next week passes in a blur of balls and parties, and things happen so fast that soon the Silvertons forget about the cat and stop asking her who returned him. And finally, Friday dawns, and we set the stage for our nail-in-the-coffin moment. Waterburn decides to stir the pot and tells Lisbeth, who is obviously at odds with Phoebe, that he saw the Marquess with Phoebe's cat and that Phoebe's success is manufactured. Waterburn also plants the seeds with Lord Camber, who has been gently courting Phoebe up until now, that Phoebe is loose with her favors. So Camber insists that Phoebe accompany him out to the garden. And she tries to back away and is like, no, dude, like, I don't want to. But he kind of like clamps down on her and starts dragging her out to the garden. And Jules sees this and swoops in with a giant punch that sends Camber sailing and the ball comes to a screeching halt. And Lisbeth sees this and decides that this is the perfect moment to laugh and reveal that Phoebe has been the subject of a bet. Ugh. And poor Phoebe. Ugh. She's horrified for so many reasons, but she just lets it all sink in, including the realization that Jules also knew about the bet. But the ever resilient lady that she is, she turns the tables on them and acts like she was in on it too, even taking a bow to scattered applause before she leaves. Mm. But of course, she is devastated. And Jules is furious. He knows he can't dance with Lisbeth. He can't even bear to touch her now. So he makes a pretty excuse, but she digs in deeper and says, oh, Jules, you've gone and hurt yourself and all over someone who's just a witch, quote, suddenly all pretense fell away. She saw it in his face. She was instantly all panicky entreaty. Jules, please don't. You don't want to. It's no good, Lisbeth. His voice almost cracked. I'm more sorry than I can say. I wish you all the best, but it's no good. I must. And he takes his exit, trying to catch up with Phoebe, but loses her outside. Ugh. So meanwhile, Phoebe returns to the Silvertons, hastily packs her trunk, and heads to Jules home. And she furiously enters when he opens the door and marches up to his room, saying, You've wanted me, Dryden? Take me. Ugh. And he tries to protest because he sees her fury, but she just won't relent. I don't care whether you want me anymore, she says, because you were right all along. I want you the way a woman wants a man. And I will have you tonight. Ooh, get Ah. it, girl. Take it. 
<laughs> so angry. Yes. And so Phoebe continues to rage until they finally have a tense discussion of their thoughts and their feelings, and most of everything is out in the open. But Phoebe persists in her anger, and Dryden keeps resisting, saying, not like this. He doesn't want to have sex just because she's angry. And so when she finally does calm down and relax, things start to heat up again. Mm -hmm. And they have encounter number two, which I will describe as a steamy inevitability. Well, I mean, it did help that she was not wearing any clothes under the police she borrowed. No, she was not. <laughs> <laughs> But in the morning, Phoebe tries to slip away quietly, and Jules is incredulous. Why, he finally said. The only thing that's changed is that we've made love. You want what you want, and I want what I want, and I'm leaving. It's that simple. Phoebe, please don't try to stop me. I haven't the strength for it. I do not want to argue. I do not want to be persuaded. We had one perfect night. Let it be enough. But Jules can't let it be enough because although he hadn't planned to say it, it tumbles out. I love you. And, quote, she kissed her fingers and laid them on his lips, stopping him from saying anything more. Thank you, she said. Don't follow me. Yikes. Oh. Oh. And while he is devastated, he knows what he must do. It's time to let go of one dream for another. So he lets down Isaiah as he will not be marrying Lisbeth and finds Waterburn to tell him that he's, quote, about to earn 1,000 pounds because Dryden is challenging him to a duel. Oh, man. Because <laughs> get it, Jules. You get it. Because, quote, no one, no one makes a fool of someone I love. Ah! Shouting it to the rooftops, he is. And the duel is set in Penny Royal Green because there is symbolism in ending where something began. However, it is over before it begins because Waterburn apologizes sincerely and as Dryden is a gentleman, he accepts. I know, guys. It's not the way you thought that was going to end. Nope. I know. If you will all remember, we started with a gunshot. So... He takes one more trip out to his mother's property to say goodbye to the thing that will never be and heads back into Penny Royal at a breakneck pace, trying to outrun his thoughts and his feelings, when a sudden force knocks him clean off his horse. And only once he's on the ground does Julian realize that now he's been shot. Oh, man. Meanwhile... Oh. Phoebe has returned to Miss Endicott's and is packing for Africa. She is to leave in less than a fortnight, but her calm is interrupted by Jonathan Redmond, who has seen Julian stumble into the pig and thistle, shot and bemoaning a woman who doesn't love him. Jonathan's not an idiot, and he knows it's Phoebe, so he's come to fetch her. He also informs her that Lisbeth has been sent to a convent for a while because his family has standards, and Lisbeth didn't meet them presently. <laughs> So Jonathan and Phoebe race to the pig and thistle, where after a momentary ever see Redmond posturing moment, <laughs> they admit her to the Marquess. He is doctored and sitting up and a bit drunk from all the whiskey, but otherwise okay. And the tension between Phoebe and Julian once they are in the same room is palpable, and Colin and Chase quickly make their exit. And quote, did you have to go and get yourself shot? Clearly, yes, for here you are. Unless, of course, you've stopped off on your way to Africa. Oh. Oh. <laughs> but they both recover from the scare in each other's arms, where Phoebe admits that she's been, quote, such an unforgivable coward, but I knew all along I was afraid. I, I love you. To which he replies, I know, you're forgiven. Huh. And this glib statement is followed by a beautiful and heartfelt proposal, which Phoebe doesn't have the chance to accept because they are interrupted by a knock. It seems that a young man was working on his target practice past when the light was good and he missed the target because his forelock had gotten into his eyes <laughs> and his shot had gone wild and hit Dryden. And his very good father was making him come clean and accept punishment. Yes, good father. <laughs> and the punishment that Dryden insists on, quote, I'd like you to cut off that damned forelock. <laughs> After they leave, Phoebe is able to say yes. <laughs> and then we have an epilogue. Yay! They get married just two days later by special license, and Miss Endicott winks at her and says she knew Phoebe was destined for a triumphant match. Soon after their wedding, though, Jules begins his plan. He lets slip at White's one day that, quote, Do you know, it's a strange thing, but lately I find it very unfashionable to be fashionable. 
The ton does not know what to do with this, and so they're out of sorts for a while and are only rewarded a couple of weeks later when he finishes this plan. Quote, Although I believe that original ought to be fashionable. Don't you agree? Uniquely lovely and interesting things, and people, for instance. He paused for delivering his coup de grace casually. In fact, I can't imagine anything more tragic and absurd than being a twin. Ooh. He gave a short, pitying laugh. What could be less original than two identical people? Ugh, well, needless to say that the Silverton twins are on a tour of the continent. And soon enough, Charybdis allowed Julian to pet his belly safely. <laughs> Adorable. Well, we certainly have made it. That was an exciting one, but a long one. So I think I need a little breather. Shall we adjourn to the parlor? We shall. This week, we're going to keep it really short and sweet. We have a pretty simple ask of you listeners. We would love it if you would take the time to leave us a review. Reviews really help us get found, and you can leave us a review either on Apple Podcasts or on our Facebook page, and both of those have links in our show notes. And also, if you like what you hear here, we would love for you to help spread the word by telling a friend. Word of mouth is another way that podcasts grow, and we want to grow. So <laughs> yes. we appreciate any legwork that you help us do. And if you are sharing with a friend, you can direct them to our Instagram at T and Strumpets and our Twitter at T and Strumpets. T is in Tom and is in Nancy Strumpets. We're also on Facebook and on Pinterest. And if you search T and Strumpets on YouTube, you will find us. And if you really want to be in the know, then sign up for email notifications on our website. Our email subscribers get to know everything first. You get the whole month of episodes in the first email of the month. And we don't send too many, but we do send some other special things. So... You can sign up for that on our website, romancepod.com. All right, Zoe, let's talk about our general thoughts on this book. I was pleasantly surprised. What about you? I was less pleasantly surprised. It's oh. really funny because writing the synopsis, there was so much that I – liked about it. And I like when I pulled the storyline out, I liked it. But I think that the, the she's all that trope, um, I'm just not that into it. I did appreciate that Phoebe, you know, turned it on his head and she wasn't just the victim, right? She wasn't mm -hmm. just completely devastated by it. I loved her reaction to it. But I think that generally I see that one and I know it's coming. You have yeah. to know it's coming because oh, you part of yeah. it is, is seeing both sides. But I just, I don't derive as much joy from that. I think probably it comes from having been picked on just really mercilessly for many, many, many years of school and mm -hmm. bullied. And so I think that when I see that happening and also like I tried so hard to get people to like me and to be friends with me as a kid. So I think like maybe I just see that and it makes me like sad, right? Like she's experiencing this moment of triumph and I love that the character kind of knows it's absurd, right? Mm -hmm. She knows that it's crazy that this is happening to her and she's not looking at it She's looking at it in the best way possible. So I think like Julianne Long has done a really good job with this trope um, yeah. and with writing a story like this because I don't dislike it. I think I just am like a little bit uncomfortable. And while I was uncomfortable with Colin's behavior, let's say in Romancing Mr. Bridgerton, mm -hmm. It was a different uncomfort. It's, you know, it's a different, it was just a different feeling. Um, he, I felt like needed that to happen in order for his growth. In here, I just kind of, I felt like there was so much going on in this story. I almost didn't need that part of the story. Like, I think there could have been a different way to get them together. I, it was still very good. I just didn't love it. And I had another part that I got kind of mad at. Okay. Well, but maybe I should let you give some general thoughts before <laughs> I, I bring that down. That's fair. I didn't remember much about this book. Um, yeah. But I really did like Phoebe. 
Mm-hmm. Like, I really liked her. And I really liked the conversations the two of them had together. Like, God, their Jules banter is, a, is so good. Their banter is so good. And, like, Jules as a character, like, he wasn't one where you saw, like, a big growth or a big epiphany. However, I think that the difference for him with me was, like, even with some whatever things that happened, like, he was fairly sure of himself as a character. Mm -hmm. And so even when he was questioning things, you know, it was more just because, oh, well, like, I've always wanted it this way. And now things are obviously changing. So let me reevaluate, you know. And I liked that about him because he was very willing to reevaluate and very quickly as well. Yeah, he didn't he didn't play it out so long. Basically, like he tried doing you know, he was like, you should be my mistress, which is what he's always known. Yeah. And Phoebe was like, no. And he was like, wait, but like really like you um how can how can i make you be part of my life Mm -hmm. and it was pretty quickly right that he comes to the realization like i can't marry elizabeth what am i thinking yeah you know this is a this is a decision i want to make and he and he makes that decision so like for sure admirable Mm -hmm. well especially when he realizes like elizabeth's true character and like that girl's a fucking bitch like you know I see, I think she's not so bad. I think now, that she goes along with it for so long. First, she's just, she's always been very, she's described as extremely literal, literal, right? Yes. Easy to tease. She's constantly been teased and picked on by her Redmond cousins. So even though she's the belle of the ball and pampered and teased, she's no Violet for sure, right? Mm-hmm. But at the same time, she... She has an idea of what's going on between Phoebe and Jules, and she sees it happening under her own nose, and she scrambles, and she does it in a very poor way, but it seems like it's right for her character. I mean, and that I understand. Like, I get she's very literal, and I get that – and I mean, she saw it immediately. However, Mm -hmm. I just, like – but it was, you know, Phoebe had said, you know, she's a very literal creature, easy to tease, like, but she is bright, and, like, generally liked Lisbeth, and then – Lisbeth just continued, but from the first second of it, she's like, oh, go get my, you know, shawl. Go get this. And Sophie's like, and Phoebe's like, I wasn't here to be a servant. It's just this constant, I'm going to make you feel bad about yourself because I see what's going on and I don't like it. So I'm just going to assert that I'm better than you. And that's what I didn't like about her. Oh, I mean, I didn't like her either. I don't think we're supposed to like her. I think I just felt a little bit, maybe a little bit more empathy or sympathy for her, for her situation. I get that. I would have liked her to be more of a villain. Yes, I would have liked her to be more of a villain in that sense. Does that make sense? Because she was like on this cusp of like, was villain-esque, but Mm -hmm. wasn't the villain. Like, yeah. so it was kind of weird in that dynamic. And something that we didn't talk about is that when I was writing the synopsis, I was trying really hard because it's it's an interesting plot. This was a really difficult one for me to write the synopsis of and feel like I actually had the story because as is the case with a lot of Julianne Long books, there's so much that's said in the dialogue and mm-hmm. not just said, but developed, I should say, in the dialogue. There's so much that's developed in the dialogue and you can't just put the dialogue in a synopsis. You have to try to convey the thoughts and the feelings and that there is development and chemistry happening. Mm-hmm. There was so much development, so much chemistry, and yeah. it just felt like a disservice to not keep it in there. And so mm-hmm. what did get cut out of there is a significant portion of cat capers, which is <laughs> unfortunate. There is so much more cat capers and like just little like sparkling moments of charybdis like doing fun things and Mm -hmm. it's a shame that it wasn't in here but the exciting thing is for any of our listeners who do pick up the book they're gonna get so much fun cat stuff so they are and i really i love the cat he's adorable he is what else did you like about the book i really liked how now harking back to earlier Penny Royal Green books and how we kind of felt, you know, in Chase's book, like that we were running around and there were so many clues and not Mm -hmm. enough clues, you know, and all these things happening. And it was very confusing. I felt that Julie Ann Long was subtle with her breadcrumbs, but Mm -hmm. also obvious about them. And I liked that because it was done subtly, but you knew the breadcrumbs were there and you could follow the path. So things weren't like a 
gasp surprise. I mean, the biggest surprise was when, you know, Jules wasn't actually shot in a duel. Like, yeah, that was good. That was the only (laughs) surprise you did get. But everything else was such a nice little breadcrumb from her looking at the bonnet and him buying her the bonnet to the mention of the gloves and how Mm -hmm. she knew they weren't really meant for her. And then, you know, to tie it in with like the blue bow and the cat and yeah, all sorts of things that I left out at the synopsis. So yep, fun, sorry for, guys. fun for readers. <laughs> but but what was in the synopsis, for example, was at one point, you know, Jules overhears Waterburn and DeAndre talking about a bet. And to us, the reader, it almost there's almost a moment of like, oh, come on, they're obviously talking, but there really is no rational reason why at that point in time, he would think that they were talking about him. He's in a totally other location doing other things. And he just overhears them talking about stupid shit. And he thinks that they're vapid. So it's just, it makes sense. You're like you said, the Mm -hmm. the breadcrumbs are subtle and purposeful. And and I totally agree. Now, so (laughs) the thing that frustrates me is the epilogue. Um, So while I appreciate the cleverness of Jules using his notoriety uh, Mm -hmm. for defending Phoebe, I think it's really cruel and vengeful for him to make the Silverton sisters such pariahs. And I don't necessarily think that they deserve that. Because if you think about what happened to the men, like, well, what happened to DeAndre and what happened to Waterburn? Well, they came and apologized to him. So they didn't have a duel. And when they left, they left to go to some other gambling thing. And Jules was like, the lion even said something about how, like, he doesn't think that they learned their lesson. So now he goes to the Silverton sisters and just makes them completely social pariahs. I don't think that that punishment fits the crime. You know, they were they were manipulated, too. And no, yes, it- I I disagree with the whole they were manipulated, too. I don't think they were manipulated, too. I think they were born and Waterburn proposed the idea to them and they thought it was going to be the best hilarious thing ever. And they were very happy to be participants in it. And so I don't think they were manipulated. I think they were just bored ladies who needed something to entertain themselves and were just like, well, it'll be fun. I mean, perhaps. Because even... Even Phoebe says she doesn't trust them fully because they have this mischievous glint where she knows that they are not girls that should be trusted. Yeah, but at the same time, they also, like, weren't as malicious as Lizbeth. And so, I don't know. I just... And True. Lizbeth got her comeuppance and, and and all that stuff. But I just feel like there was something about it that left a sour taste in my mouth and kind of, like, lowered my opinion of him for stooping to that. And I get that he's, like, defending his woman and everything, but I also felt like... I don't know. I just didn't feel like the punishment fit the crime, especially when contrasted with the fact that Waterburn and DeAndre had none. Yes, but I think that, you know, I think that was just one thing to talk about how the Silverton sisters got it. But I think his first comment about being it's unfashionable to be fashionable. And then like he really just wanted to make his mark on the Silverton sisters. And frankly, I think they're going to be able to come back. They were just touring the continent for a while to just get away from it. There'll be new gossip next time. No, and let's I know. be real. I think it's silly in the epilogue only because I'm just like, I highly doubt that Lord Dryden like owns this much social power after marrying <laughs> Phoebe. True. That it was more unbelievable to me that the ton so st- like was still so like blatantly like hung on every word in his fashionableness. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm sorry. As soon as he married Phoebe, like, and then it was the same woman who was like announced at the party to just be a joke. Like he was not going to be fashionable anymore. He was not going to wield that kind of power. So frankly, That's true. for That's me, fair. the epilogue, it wasn't harsh. It was like, unbelievable because I'm like, that dude <laughs> does not have this much power anymore. All right. Well, we've talked a lot about him. So let's give him a rating, shall we? What am I going to rate him? Hmm. What are you going to rate him? So for me, I like him, but I don't love him. Mm-hmm. Um, especially the ending knocked it down for me. Um, it just did. I just left kind of a, a sour taste in my mouth. Um, I, there was another part somewhere in the earlier bit of the book that also had kind of a similar feel to me. And it it, it has escaped me for the moment, but... Regardless of that, I give him a 6.5. I just didn't love him that much. Oh. He was a 7, but then the epilogue knocked him down a little bit. Okay. I, I'm i going to say, I'm going to say like 7.5. I was like, 
Mm -hmm. Capitulating between like a seven and an eight. Yeah. Because like he's kind of in that range. I like his banter. I think he's fun. You know, I like that he kind of. He has good like, lines. has this cold <laughs> exterior and then becomes this, like, warm, gooey person around her, you know, full of life, full of, like, mm-hmm. joy. Passion. Passion. All these things that no one else sees in him. I really like yes. that. And he really does care for her and, like, shows it from the beginning. Like, he never tries to hide it. I mean, like, mm-hmm. hide it in a sense, but, like, he's not very good at hiding it. I'm not going to lie. He's always very open about his interest in her, at least to her. Like, he never tries to hide it from her. Yeah. So that's kind of what gives him that higher rating for me. And what about Phoebe? I'm going to rate Phoebe like a nine. I really like her. She is good. But for me, she is not a nine. For me, she's a seven. She was almost an eight. And the reason that she was bumped down is because her, I don't know, I just didn't love her tantrum when she like came to his house, like, take me. And while that was, like, feminist and fun, I just also, like, there was just something about it that turned me off. And I just didn't find it as appealing that she was, like, having a tantrum about he needed to take her. On the flip side, there were so many other wonderful things about Phoebe, which is why I think she's a seven, which is, to me, great, right? Yeah. But, you know, there were so many good lines. She had she just matched him wit for wit. She challenged him. She was funny. She was flirty. She mm-hmm. was sure of herself. She bowed when, you know, when she left the ballroom. Like, yeah. she just was such a star. So, okay, I'm going to change it. She's a 7.5. She gets a little higher. She, but she that's, is. For me, she is a star. And for you, me, I did not dislike her rant. Like, for me, I was like, well, she obviously it wasn't can't. Unreasonable. It wasn't unreasonable. Just, and like he even says, it's not like, you know, he took her in that rage. Like he calmed her down and she was just like, okay, I'm calm now. Like, but we're still going to do this because like she said, it's like, I want one perfect night. You know, she's yeah. mad. She's angry. And it's like, you know, she needs to, she's got now all this passion she can't unleash and she's going to unleash it on him and have a magical night for it. And then she's going to leave and it's, she's going to go to Africa and Teach to her heart's content. Or not. Or not. (laughs) So we talked a lot about how funny it was and how great the writing was. So do you have a favorite quote from this book? Yes, I have two. And they're both pretty much one-liners. And this is one of Phoebe's one-liners, which is, and you've said everything you have to say. That's a shame. I was under the impression that conversation perpetuates itself if done properly. Ah, I did almost pick that one. (laughs) (laughs) That one's a great one. And then to end it, I just love this one. I even put needs to be in promo. And emotions are an arctic, she told him. They resist legislation. He'd never stop trying to do just that. But his control was both his weakness and his strength. And he was a man who was precise, who did the right thing, the perfect thing. Yeah, it's a good one. See? I didn't even highlight enough of it. (laughs) So my quote is, as often the case for me and these books, is a piece of Julianne Long's fantastic writing. And this, the first paragraph is a little bit of setup, so I'm going to read it. And then it's the second paragraph that I love so much. But this is when Phoebe is has just told Jules about her upbringing and losing her father and her mother and how Charybdis was her savior, kind of, and has been Mm -hmm. with her since her time in London. So, Dead Kitten. He looked at her, fine skin, worn walking dress, new bonnet, and the thought was unbearable. She'd been so afraid she'd needed a kitten for a talisman. He almost couldn't breathe from imagining it. He understood now that her unique light The light he basked in existed by virtue of all those shadows, and the shadows were what made her seem more real than everyone else, threw her into relief. That was so good. That was such a good line. (laughs) Yeah, so great job, Julianne Long. But now we're going to get a little more ribald here because (laughs) we have our steaminess rating and our encounter counter. So we have two encounters in this book, but what do you think about steaminess? Um... I mean, like, it seemed fun. It seemed yeah. nice. And that's kind of, like, my best description of it as far as steaming is. Like, yeah, it was, like, almost like you spilled a little tea on your lap, like it sloshed out of the cup, right? And it, like, yeah. burned you a little. And then you're like, oh, oh, wait. Uh, 
oh yeah, I got to get back to my tea, right? Yeah. Because now like, it's oh, the wait, right I'm temperature. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, yeah, there was like this angry, like passion and this, the, the actual sex was, was seemed fun and cool, but yeah, there was so much chemistry between the characters that like their banter was more fun for me than yeah, the sex. I think the, the 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 tension and the banter definitely got me more going than like the actual like sexiness of things. Like yeah. he she seemed like he she had a good time when he went down on her. Like that seemed nice. Yeah. I, and I like, love the way that she stopped that <laughs> afterwards. Like, is that an invitation? No. Definitely not. <laughs> uh, no, we're not here to do that. But thank you for asking. Yeah. Uh, so that leads very well into our feminist recap. So <laughs> what do you think? So I think that this one is a supporter. I think that while I still argue some troubling things about, you know, the friendships and the girls being mean to each other, again, I think that's more of a product of their circumstances, mm-hmm. a little bit, you know, Regina Georgie, you know, and her plastics yeah. in a sense. I still think, though, that Phoebe herself is so strong and does make so many great decisions and so many, oh, yeah. has so many feminist moments that overall, I think that this is a a very positive book. I would say that too. And I would also say Jules never does anything Mm-mm. to like have her question that. He never tries to force his opinion on her. He's always very respectful of her choices. And in fact, the only thing, the only very macho male thing he does is when he sees another male trying to force himself upon her, you and know, potentially being respectful on and her not choices. being respectful, then he goes into action, which that's fine. <laughs> Yes. I mean, if you see a woman being overpowered, I think it's perfectly acceptable to leap into action. Yes. So do you so you agree that I would 100 percent agree that it's a supporter. I think that the interaction between them was very positive. And like we said, though, like Lisbeth wasn't really like a true villain. She was a woman reacting to her circumstances and potentially her future being threatened. She had shades of gray, right? Mm -hmm. She was. And that's why I think like. And maybe I had more sympathy for the Silverton sisters in the same way, because I think depending on your experiences and and what you've been through, maybe you read read it differently, right? Because you yeah. kind of see different t- sides of the story. So I don't know. I, I agree. I'm willing to forgive that a little bit because Phoebe was so strong. Agreed. So final book review, Zoe. What do we think? I give this book a solid uh, seven. Oh, me too. <laughs> I think this is a good book. It's I a good recommend book. reading it. You know what? And you know what else I didn't talk about? Is that okay. this book actually is a little bit similar to Miles and Cynthia's book. It is a man yes. of means and a woman of no means and mm-hmm. no family who are forbidden basically from being together. And it even happens at a house party at the Redmonds. Yes. Like that's where it starts. Mm-hmm. And while there are definite differences in this, I think that reading the two stories so close together kind of does a disservice because if you maybe identify with the hero or heroine in one book more than the other, you're going to like one a little more than the other. Mm -hmm. But if you read this book particularly out of context of all of the Eversee books, I think it would shine a little bit more. I think so too, because over, like, I really didn't remember it all that much. It was kind of like my first foray into weird side characters, and I was like, what's happening here? But I really thoroughly enjoyed it. Like, it was just, it was fun. It was playful. I got into it. It was a great read, great dialogue, you know, fun cat. Fun cat. Fun cat. I mean, yeah, there was a lot to love about this book. Mm -hmm. I just think, like, if you haven't read a Julianne Long, this is this might be a great place to start. I think this mm-hmm. is stronger than The Perils of Pleasure significantly. Okay. Yeah. And you don't have to really know anything about the family in this case. Like No. I mean, they give you they give you kind of the one little like Easter egg about yeah. Lion Olivia. and Olivia. Yeah. But like that's all they give you. And it's just because in all these books you get some little snippet of the story. I just thought it was fun rereading it because the thing about the gloves, you hear mention of it later on and I had forgotten Mm -hmm. where it had come from. And so to like get that back, I was like, ooh, look at this. (laughs) Yeah. Ah, but we still don't get to read Lion's book for a while more. No, long time, guys. We're working on it. (laughs) Slowly but surely. 
<laughs> slowly but surely we will get there hey we're at number six we are halfway through the series oh yeah there we go <laughs> i know it's crazy so i would ask you what we are reading next time but that question isn't quite accurate is it no it is not because next time we're not reading a book at all but we do have a very special treat for you all We sure do, because next time we are sitting down with Kerrigan Byrne to talk about everything. (laughs) Oh, yes. Full disclosure, we've already recorded this interview, and we just can't wait to share it with you. No, we had a great time. And at some points, the conversation got a little deep, but you know, that's just (laughs) where the world, that's just where the words were taking us. And that's where we went. It sure is. And you know what? We are so thankful to Kerrigan for coming on the show and talking to us about all sorts of cool things. So you can find that right here where you're listening to this podcast in one week's time. Yes. Tune in to hear our chat with Kerrigan Byrne. So thank you so much for listening and join us next week. And may all your ever afters end happily. Tea and Strumpets is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. I, sorry, as an aside, because it will. How do you pronounce the S-C-U-I-L-L-A? I think it's Skyla. Skyla? Okay. Do you want me to my, check it? My dog is snorting at the door. <laughs> She's like, I'm not allowed in. Let's go real quick. Pronunciation. Oh, oh, oh. You're totally right. It's wrong. I'm wrong. Sila or Skila. Skila. Okay. Depending on what country you live in. Okay. Go with Skila because it sounds good. Okay. I'm just going to put that into the notes and here we go. Sophie is going to be wearing the bonnet and he is rewarded with her beaming her name's, smile. Her name is Phoebe, not Sophie. Fuck. <laughs> You're right. I, d- I almost wrote Sophie so many times. You don't, I don't know why. <laughs> but anyway, he is hoping that Sophie, he is Phoebe. hoping that Phoebe is wearing. The- <laughs> Emotions are an Arctic, she told him. They resist legislation. Oof, so I like that. good. That one's a good one. So my favorite quote is just like a piece of really beautiful Julianne Long writing, as I so often oh, choose. I'm sorry, Zoe. I just made a mistake and I just kept reading after that and it's more beautiful and I'm going to okay, continue going. it. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Emotions are an art. Perilous. Perilously. Sorry, I spelled it wrong. It's okay. Perilous. <laughs> Perilously close to happy. Needless- Perilous. Peril. Per- Perilous. Lee, (laughs) Julian feels perilously close to happy. Julian feels perilously close, perilously close to happy. Needless to say, he's surprised. Jeez. But we made it. (laughs) At least we're giggling.